knife fighting advice from martial artists is almost universally terrible. Just pure fantasy. Now, when I talk about knife fighting, I'm talking about small to medium sized knives. Things like machetes and kukris are outside of the scope of this video and deserve their own discussion. While combat sports have given us a large body of experts on hand to hand fighting, literally no one on earth is an expert in knife fighting. Not Doug Markaida, not Craig Douglas, no one. For the simple reason that nobody has ever had enough knife fights to gain expert status and live to talk about it. Anyone that claims they've spent 10,000 hours winning to the death knife duels is a liar. Now, just because I don't really count anyone as an expert on knife fighting doesn't mean we can't know anything. We do still have some decent ways of gathering information on real knife encounters, namely knife attacks caught on camera. So content warning for this entire video because you're going to see people get stabbed to death. Now, let's dive into everything your instructor doesn't know about knife fighting. First off, there's an idea out there, common in many martial arts, that your main focus with a knife should be to slash at your opponent's limbs to cut muscle and tendons and make their limb useless. This is commonly referred to as defanging the snake, or just limb disabling if you're not a weirdo. But regardless of what you call it, it's still equally not real. Muscles and tendons are difficult to cut and even harder to target. Fighting a person is nothing like those meat cutting tests on YouTube. Live muscle is tough, constantly in motion and surrounded by layers of skin, fat and collagen. The idea that you're going to successfully target and fully sever a tendon on a flailing limb is complete fantasy. It would be like cutting off all the fat on a steak while I'm doing this with it. It can happen, it's just not going to happen on purpose. While researching this video, I saw a lot of people get stabbed. I saw a lot of people die. I saw slit throats, punctured lungs, arterial bleeds, you name it. But in all of those videos, I could only find a single instance in which anyone's limb was disabled. And it also happened to be the one person that was clearly using a karambit. That's right, the only person that used a karambit got their hand disabled by being stabbed with a straight bladed knife, which if you saw my Karamets video is just Mwah! But also someone got stabbed, so sorry. Also, the guy with the Karambit just switched hands and kept going because disabling a limb doesn't end the fight. In war, soldiers have had limbs blown completely off their bodies and kept going. Severing a tendon might not even phase them. He looked down and he said, there's a arm next to me and there's a hand grenade into that mother I better throw this grenade. He grabs the grenade, throws it into this machine gun nest. Boom. If you need a more direct illustration of this, take the example of the insane people in Germany that fought each other with real long swords, which is a horrible thing that I love watching and no one should ever do it even though it's awesome. Anyway, in one of those matches, someone got a bad cut on their arm. Not only did this not disable their limb, but they didn't even notice it. Their opponent had to point it out. Oh, 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 oh. And he was hit by a long sword. Your three inch pocket knife is not going to defang any snakes. Keep in mind that I watched dozens of videos and saw this exactly once, even when specifically searching for examples of limb disabling. You're far more likely to completely kill someone than you are to disable their limbs. Relying on a strategy of targeting muscle and tendons is stupid. Limb disabling is an example of martial arts theory meeting reality and coming up short. It is the least likely way for anyone to win a knife fight. Next up, we have the age old debate of whether it's better to use a knife to thrust or to cut. And what you're probably expecting me to say is it depends because that's what every martial artist says about everything. But guess what? It doesn't depend. This is one of the rare instances where there's a firm, incontrovertible answer. Thrusting is better, period. Sure, a cut is better than nothing. I wouldn't turn one down, but there is no valid knife fighting strategy built around cutting. Now, I acknowledge that's a very bold claim, so I'm going to defend it vigorously. In my original video on karambits, I pointed out that historical examples of fighting knives are overwhelmingly able to thrust. So the historical argument is done and out of the way. Go watch that video. Now let's address the blade design argument. If you want to really understand this next section, go watch my video on sword mechanics first. It's okay, I'll wait. You're back! 
So hopefully you now know that swords use either thrusting, cutting, or chopping motions to create penetration, and that each of these three strategies is aided by specific design characteristics. However, knives are a little bit different than swords, because they're, well, smaller. I know that's painfully obvious, but it also really matters. Cutting blades require a large edge area, and chopping blades rely on mass to build momentum. Knives have both an abysmally small cutting area and lack the mass necessary to chop. As an example, this knife has all the characteristics you would expect of a chopping blade. However, it's just too small to be any good at it. It's a fine knife for general use, but it kinda sucks at fighting because most knives are too small to be optimized for either cutting or chopping, that leaves thrusting as the only valid strategy left. Because it travels in a straight line, the mass, balance point, and edge area really don't matter. In fact, a shorter blade is likely going to be stiffer than a longer one, which could make thrusting easier. The only catch is that your blade has to be long enough to reach vital organs before bottoming out. But that same limitation applies to every blade. Virtually all other strategies for defeating an opponent in melee combat, such as hooking or blunt force trauma, really only become optimal against armored opponents, which knives and even swords have never been very good at anyway. And in case that wasn't enough to convince you, let's now turn our attention to what the medical community has to say about the effectiveness of cuts and thrusts. To quote a 2012 study on fatal incised wounds, which are cuts, Incised wounds are less dangerous than stabs, as the relative shallowness of the wound is less likely to affect vital organs. And here's a specialist in combat trauma medicine saying the same thing. But a slash or a laceration is far less deadly than a puncture. Death occurs more likely because of punctures because you're hitting those vital organs. And in case you think that someone that looks like me couldn't possibly understand knife encounters, here's a quote from the infamous book Put Em Down, Take Em Out, which collected prison knife fighting techniques from inmates that had actually killed people with knives. Slashing is another ludicrous technique perpetuated through television and the martial arts. In reality, slashing techniques are prolonged and risky. Wow. But let's throw all of that aside and just believe what our eyes tell us. In preparation for this video, I watched several dozen knife attacks, covering all different sorts of scenarios. And despite that research, I can't even conclude that cuts were less effective. Because cuts basically didn't happen. Nearly everyone, from innocent people to homicidal maniacs to experienced killers, used exclusively thrusts. In fact, in only three videos did anyone use any cutting motions at all. One attacker had a kitchen knife with no point, a store owner defended himself with a knife so large that it's practically a short sword, and another attacker had a box cutter. While the person with a giant knife did manage to scare their attacker off, none of these people managed to disable their opponent. All three cases that involved cuts featured unusual knife designs that were either incapable of thrusting or noticeably larger than the kinds of knives we're talking about. In the several dozen other examples, knife wielders exclusively used stabbing motions. Whether looking at historical examples, design requirements, medical literature, practical experience, or real world data, the conclusion is exactly the same. Thrusting is better than cutting, period. It gives better penetration, ergonomics, and lethality in every conceivable scenario. But now I hear people grumbling. Why should I care about lethality? I just want a knife for self-defense. I don't need to kill people. Actually, you kind of do. Knives are great tools, but terrible self-defense weapons because they can only be used from close range and they lack any real stopping power. Hitting someone with pepper spray can blind them. Oh God. <coughs> Hitting someone with a stun gun can make them reactively pull away, and hitting someone with a taser can entirely shut down their ability to move. <laughs> Guns have all sorts of crazy effects like cavitation shattering bones and pressure waves disrupting the nervous system. Knives don't have any of these things. The ways that a knife can physically stop an attacker is by causing massive hemorrhaging or damaging vital organs. And both of those things are pretty fatal. Using a knife to stop someone and using a knife to kill someone are usually the same thing. If you look at videos of knife attacks, you'll see that the person that stabbed or cut continues to move largely unimpeded, even with some nasty wounds. 
As an example, here's a man that fought off a knife-wielding assailant and was able to walk himself to the ambulance and give a fully coherent statement to police. He was stabbed 23 times and suffered a severed diaphragm and punctured lung. Without medical attention, those would be lethal wounds. Yet, in the short term, his mental and physical abilities were only barely affected, and he retained the ability to fight his attacker off. Here's another knife fight in which the instigator gets stabbed numerous times. Deciding that he no longer likes being a human pincushion, he calmly walks away, gets on his scooter, and drives off. He died within minutes. Even fatal knife wounds often do not incapacitate people, and many attackers can only be stopped once their soul has fully vacated the mortal plane. If you can't use your knife to kill people, then you can't use your knife for self-defense. People have tried to draw a distinction between fighting with a knife and killing with a knife, but that distinction is purely fictional. Knife deaths are almost never instant, meaning that you have to fight someone in order to kill them, and you often have to kill them in order to win the fight. If you made a Venn diagram of using a knife to incapacitate and using a knife to kill, you would have a circle. Punches are literally better at ending fights quickly than knives are, because you at least have the chance at knocking someone out. But that doesn't mean that knives are worse than fists. Knives are useful not because they make victory quicker, but because they make it a lot more likely, at the cost of having a far deadlier and more gruesome encounter. Now, some of you might be thinking, but then shouldn't we attack their limbs to bleed them to death by targeting major veins and arteries? Short answer, no. Long answer, targeting veins and arteries presents the same problems as targeting tendons. They're small, rapidly moving targets you're not going to hit them with any sort of reliability. Well, at least not on the limbs. If you want to bleed someone to death, you should note that the torso and neck have far larger veins and arteries than the limbs do, allowing someone to bleed out much quicker. Plus, the torso isn't nearly as mobile as the limbs, making it a much easier target to hit. The only downside is that there's a lot of meat between your knife and the arteries, meaning that your weapon has to have good penetration. In other words, it should be good at stabbing. And even if you miss the critical arteries, the torso is chock full of vital organs. When targeting a limb, even a deep, penetrating wound could be virtually inconsequential to someone's survival. But the same wound on the torso is almost guaranteed to hit something important. In fact, a stab to something like the heart is probably the quickest possible way to actually win a knife fight. And yes, when it comes to accessing veins and arteries, the neck is technically a better target. However, it's also a lot smaller and easily tucked behind a lot of bone. Plus, it doesn't have the vital organ consolation prize that the torso does. The neck is still a great target, it just might be a little harder to access. All right, now we know how a knife is supposed to be used, but how do we actually use one? What do we physically do? I'm glad you asked. Now, this is the one part of the video that might actually be up for debate, because everyone has different instincts and body types. Plus, every situation is different, so your goal with a knife might not always be the same. However, when we look at real knife uses, we can quickly see certain patterns emerge. First of all, it's worth noting that the vast majority of knife usage caught on tape is performed by criminals. Self-defense with a knife does happen, but it seems to be exceptionally rare at least in places that have cameras around. Second of all, actual knife fights where both people have knives are also very rare. They can happen, but they're very much the exception and not the rule. The vast majority of knife violence that I can find video of is sudden criminal assault. It often either follows an argument or completely comes out of the blue from a mentally disturbed individual. So when I teach you how to use a knife successfully, Understand that there is virtually no scenario where you are justified in using this. We're largely just pursuing knowledge for its own sake. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's address grip. Do we want a forward grip or a reverse grip? I can tell you that forward grip seems to be much more common. Reverse grip is very strong, but it hampers your reach and creates a weirder angle. It seems to mainly be useful for hitting stationary targets either people with their back to you or people that you're on top of. Obviously, neither of those scenarios have many legally justifiable variations. Anyone that isn't committing blatant murder should usually hold the knife point up. And even if you are a murderer, point up still seems to be the preferred grip among both amateurs and experienced killers. So let's get more specific. Should we use a saber grip or a hammer grip? 
I was personally in favor of the saber grip, but in Put Him Down, Take Him Out, the author seems intent on the idea that the hammer grip, which he calls hit grip, is more secure. And you know, after stabbing enough hard objects with training knives, I have to begrudgingly agree. With a saber grip, the force of your hit largely transfers into your thumb as it slams into the guard. Or if there's no guard on the back, it transfers into your pointer finger. And when you repeatedly hit something hard, like a tree or bone, it actually kind of sucks. A hammer grip, however, allows your thumb to fully wrap around and reinforce your grip, making the grip so much tighter that your hand really shouldn't slide up the knife at all, meaning that the force of your hit should spread out over your entire hand. Plus, a saber grip leaves an obvious weak point for your knife to be peeled out of your grip. The hammer grip eliminates this weakness. And yeah, the saber grip feels like you have better control and dexterity, but you don't need dexterity. This isn't a rapier duel, it's a shanking. Okay, so you should be using a hammer grip, but should you hold the knife in your lead hand or your rear hand? Now, this is where the answer might actually depend. If you want to be able to effectively take someone out, the knife should almost always be in your rear hand. It's been found in other studies on knife attacks that the knife is held in the rear hand 71.1% of the time, and the videos I've seen would largely agree with that assessment. The lead hand is typically used to secure the target or enforce distance so that the rear hand can inflict damage. This allows the unarmed hand to be useful while keeping your knife safe from being grabbed, and often keeping it hidden until you're ready to strike. And keeping a blade hidden is often a key component of real knife assaults, with many people feeling the knife before they've ever had a chance to see the knife. In addition, during any sort of collision or clinch, having the knife in your rear hand seems to prevent your weapon arm from getting pinned or stuffed. If you spend even a few seconds wiggling your arm free from a hold, then that could give your opponent a lot of time to use any weapon that they might have. Now, I would argue that there are some instances in which you would want your knife in your lead hand. But before we talk about exceptions to the rule, we need to talk about the dominant strategies of knife fighting and why those general rules exist. Remember that knife fights are not particularly quick, and that killing someone through blood loss or organ damage requires a lot of holes in their body to quicken the process. If both combatants have knives, the winner isn't going to be the person that lands the first hit. It's going to be the person that lands more hits. This means that the winning strategy is to seek out dominant positioning that lets you land better hits at a higher frequency. In practice, this typically involves getting to your opponent's outside angle. If both of our knives are in our rear hand, I want to circle towards my opponent's lead hand. This will allow me to reach their heart, lungs, and kidneys while staying away from their knife. Now, if I simply attempt to circle around them, they're obviously going to follow me. That's why the real battle takes place between the lead hands. If I'm able to pin my opponent, turn them, or arm drag them, I may be able to inflict a significant amount of damage before they can correct their position. And this lead hand grappling match is where size and strength are going to significantly come into play. And this strategy of circling to my opponents outside is going to be the dominant strategy for virtually every encounter. If my opponent is unarmed, I still want to circle to their outside so that their arms are unable to block or trap my arm. If the knife is in their lead hand, getting to their outside still allows me to crowd and control their knife arm while taking their free hand almost entirely out of the fight. If they have an opposite stance from me, circling to their outside will put my weapon hand in a place where it can be grabbed, but it will still line up my weapon with their torso and allow me to largely avoid any weapon that they might have. I'm risking my arm, but I'm protecting the rest of my body. And keep in mind that while your free hand should be helping you acquire a dominant angle, it should also be active. One of the big mistakes that people make is assuming that the lead hand is just going to be used to grab and hold, and that gives the defender free reign to put in their little X blocks to stop your knife hand. If someone hyper fixates on your weapon like this, start punching them in the face until they do something about it, and then stab them. Your lead hand should be jabbing, feinting, and parrying their attacks, acting as both a setup for your main offense and as your primary defense. If you're able to gain the initiative and get them reacting to your lead hand, you'll be able to open up targets for your knife. Through this lens, the vast majority of fights in which you have a knife can be simplified as a battle for the outside angle, in which your footwork, free hand, and wrestling abilities will largely decide the encounter. And the prioritization on gaining the initiative and protecting your weapon hand makes most disarm techniques extremely unlikely. 
Now, while this strategy is quite good, it does rely on your knife being in your rear hand. So, under what circumstances would you be willing to forgo this strategy and have your weapon hand lead? Well, the first scenario is cases in which this strategy definitely won't work. Remember that the goal is to use your free hand to strike and grapple your way to a superior angle. However, if your opponent is four times your size, you're likely going to lose this engagement. The moment your lead hands make contact, you're probably getting spun. If you can't physically compete with your opponent, then it might be a better option to lead with your weapon. With any luck, you might be able to keep them far enough away to prevent any wrestling or punching exchange from happening, and hopefully you're fast enough to continually move in and out of stabbing range without them trapping your arm. However, keep in mind that if you're that physically outmatched, then you're likely going to lose either way. Which leads me to the only other situation in which you should lead with your knife which is when you want to avoid the fight altogether. If you're in the rare scenario of having pulled a knife for self-defense, putting the knife forward is a good way to communicate, do not mess with me, I have a knife. The goal of this is to get your adversary to simply decide that this isn't worth getting stabbed over and back off. Having the knife in your rear hand could potentially encourage someone to try and engage you if they think that your knife is far enough away for them to avoid. But Leading with a knife ensures that they will have to deal with that weapon before anything else happens. But remember that if someone does work up the courage to engage you, you'll be caught in a less than ideal position, making it a lot more likely that your knife suddenly becomes their knife. So yeah, that's pretty much everything you need to know about knife fighting. And while knives are terrible self-defense weapons that are rarely used for any legal means, it's still worth knowing how to use them properly. Firstly, because I value knowledge for its own sake, but also because we can't begin to understand knife defense until we understand knife offense. And knife fighting is one of the subjects in martial arts that contains more bad advice than good advice. The average class on knife fighting would probably make most people worse at using a knife. And now, after doing hours of research to correct these misunderstandings, I get to spend the rest of the day reading comments about how karambits are better than long swords and that I don't understand knives because I don't have enough scar tissue. Cool! If you want to double check my findings, sources and knife attack playlists are in the description below. Thank you and have a stabtastic day. Please, I feel like I should be the knife expert in this house. <laughs>